Hey everybody. Can you hear me okay? All right. Well, I was kind of hoping Ricky would just keep going. I was sort of getting into that. Well, it's good to be here with all of you. Let me take a quick poll so I can get a better understanding of who it is I'm speaking to. How many of you are senior pastors of churches? Raise your hand up. If you're a senior pastor, okay, great. Larry, good to see you again. I haven't seen you in a long time. Okay, how many of you are associate pastors of churches? Raise your hand. Okay, you're an associate pastor. Okay, how many of you are involved in worship ministry? Raise up your hand. Okay, quite a few of you. Okay, how many of you are in Sunday school, children's ministry? Raise up your hand. Okay, great. How many of you are like maybe um, an usher, uh, or maybe you help out in counseling, something like that? Okay, who are the rest of you anyway? Uh, <laughs> are you like, what, groupies or something? No, I'm just kidding. Well, listen, I know that you're all serving the Lord, and I want to just commend you for that. Because next to being a Christian, the greatest thing I know of is actually serving God. And uh, we're just thankful that you have taken this time on a beautiful Saturday here in Maui to focus a little bit in on the Word of God. And I want to talk to you about reaching our culture. In fact, the title of my message is First Century Principles for Reaching the 21st Century. And it's found in Acts chapter 17. So if you have a Bible, and I'm sure you all do, why don't you grab it and turn to Acts 17. Hurry. <laughs> All right, let's pray together. <laughs> Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've made. We thank you for calling us into your service. And now we pray that you will help us to clear our minds and open our hearts to the Word of God. And Lord, we look at this island, and we look at these islands, and we look at this nation, and we look at this world. And for the most part, there's just a lot of people that don't know you. Yet you have given us a command. You have given us marching orders. All of us are called to go into all of the world and preach the gospel and to make disciples of the nations, teaching them to observe whatever you have commanded. And you have promised that you will be with us to the end of the age. Lord, as we look at the crazy things happening in our world today, we wonder how far off that actually is. We wonder how close your return really is. So our focus right now is to occupy till you come, to be about our Father's business, to be serving you and walking with you, actually walking with you and serving you. And so we pray now that you will bless as we look at your word, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, for me personally, and I would say that I'm something of a, of a preaching junkie, if you will, uh, I love to preach. I love to listen to people preach. When I'm driving around in my car, I find the Christian radio station and I listen to preachers. And when I'm out taking my walk in the morning, I download podcasts of preachers I like to listen to. I love to listen to preaching. How many of you are with me on that? I love it, you know? But there is nothing worse to me than bad preaching. Now, if you're a musician, I'm sure there's nothing worse than bad music. But when someone doesn't do what they're called to do well, it drives me crazy. And uh, I heard a story of a preacher that was asked to come to sort of a public meeting and say a few words. And of course, that's asking a lot, to ask a preacher to say just a few words. And so he was introduced by the moderator, and the minister got up and began to speak. He'd been given 20 minutes, which is you know, quite a bit of time. And the preacher filled the 20 minutes quickly and was it just really beginning to hit his stride. So the moderator waited another five minutes and cleared his throat, hoping the preacher would notice and stop. And, and the minister continued to go. And, and now another 15 minutes have gone. They need to get this meeting started. So the moderator pounds down his gavel a couple of times. Still, this preacher drones on. And now the moderator pounds his gavel down and the preacher won't stop out of frustration. The moderator can't take it any longer. He throws his gavel at the preacher. 
He barely misses him and hits an elderly man who had fallen asleep in the front row. The old guy woke up, saw the minister was still speaking, and said, hit me again, I can still hear him. <laughs> Have you ever felt that way listening to a sermon? <laughs> Stop. <laughs> I hope you don't feel that way right now. <laughs> but I don't know how this works. But some people almost have, I don't want to say a talent, but they have an ability to take the action-packed, power-filled Word of God and make it boring. (laughs) Even the way they read the Scripture before they even speak makes it boring. How do you make the Word of God boring? Some people have an ability to do this. Now look, some of us here are what we would call preachers, okay? Professionals, if you will. Uh, but, you know, the Great Commission yeah. is given to everybody. You know, that, that, those marching orders of our Lord to go into all the world and preach the gospel, the original Greek, number one, it's a command. It's not a suggestion. That's why we call it the Great Commission, not the Great Suggestion. <laughs> but for many, the Great Commission has become the Great Omission. We're just not doing it. But Christ has commanded us to do it. Number two, in the original language, it's implied that these words are directed to everyone to every preacher, to every missionary, to every businessman, to every housewife, to every surfer, to every skater, to every person who names the name of Christ, we're supposed to go out into all the world. So some of us speak before crowds. Some of us speak before children in a Sunday school class. Some of us speak to individuals, but we're all called to be communicators of the Word of God, right? Right. So let's think about how we can be better communicators. And let's take a page from the playbook of one of the best communicators of all time, the Apostle Paul. It's been said that if you cease to be better, you will soon cease to be good. I think we want to work at our craft, work at what we do, try to be the best at what we do as we possibly can be. Uh, One thing for sure, we want to be current in our communication. We need to speak to the world we're living in today. Uh, I heard the story of a man who was very ill. And so he went with his wife to the doctor's office and the doctor ran a battery of tests on him and then called the wife in and said, ma'am, your husband is is very sick. In fact, he has a severe disease that's actually compounded by stress. And chances are he's going to die very soon unless you make radical changes in his life. For instance, From this point on, every morning, you know, make him his favorite thing for breakfast, whatever he asks for, that's what you make him. Uh, Don't bother him with any responsibilities or chores. Again, he needs to be in a stress-free environment. Never nag him. Never hassle him. Again, for lunch, dinner, whatever he wants. And most importantly, you need to constantly affirm him and smother him with affection. Tell him how much you love him. Tell him how wonderful he is. And if you will do this for nine months to a year, your husband will make a full recovery. The wife said, thank you, doctor. She left his office, got in the car, was driving her husband home. The husband said, what did the doctor say? She said, you're going to (laughs) die. How many of you have heard that joke? Raise your hand. How many of you thought it was funnier the first time? Raise your hand. Okay. Some of us would rather see the patient die than change our methodology. You know, and and I've been in ministry now 40 years. I've been a pastor 40 years. I started preaching when I was three. (laughs) I was wearing diapers, and interestingly, I'm wearing them now. (laughs) They're called Depends. No, that's a joke. It's not true. But Ricky Ryan is. No. No. no, here's the truth. I was three years old. I preached in diapers. My first message was, based on the text, we shall all be changed. And no, I was actually, um, I became a Christian at 17. I started preaching at 19, and I started pastoring at 20. Uh, it was actually never my plan to become a pastor. Uh, my background was graphic design. I always wanted to be a cartoonist. I used to correspond with Charles Schultz, the guy who did Peanuts, and I did cartoon strips on our paper and submitted cartoons. I actually had two cartoons published in Surfer Magazine. 
And you know, when you're going to Corona Del Mar High School and you're published in Surfer at age 16, you're a rock star, man. <laughs> you know? And um, so that was my goal. I want to be a cartoonist. I, that's all I want to do. Well, I became a Christian. That was not my plan. That was God's plan, thankfully. And so for a while, I was a Christian cartoonist, cartoonist, uh, doing little tracks, and then I started doing some album covers and other things. But the last thing I ever wanted to be was a preacher, because like most people, I had a fear of public speaking. But uh, the Lord was beginning to open doors for me. And, and there was one experience I had that was sort of like a sneak preview of things to come. You know, like when you go to the movies and you watch the trailers, and they're generally better than the film itself? <laughs> I sort of had a trailer of my life coming. And I was just serving the Lord, just going to church, uh, doing my little cartoon booklets and so forth. And there was a baptism down at uh, Big Corona Beach in Newport Beach that Calvary Chapel put on. This is back in the days of the Jesus movement. And I got there late and missed it. I had the time wrong. And so, oh man, I missed it. What a drag, you know? And I saw a group of Christians sitting around. So there were about 30 of them just singing songs. So I sat down and joined them, and we were sort of singing songs together. And, uh, and no one was really leading, no one was saying anything, and I had a little something the Lord had shown me in my devotion that morning, so I was a little nervous, but I said, hey, you know, I had something I'd like to share right now. <laughs> they all just looked at me like, okay, so I shared my little mini sermon. And uh, while I was speaking, if you will, <laughs> uh, a couple of girls came up, and and then when I was done, they leaned over and said, Pastor, we missed the baptism. Can you baptize us? I said, oh, I'm not a pastor. I, I'm just a Christian. And, no, but we want to be baptized. A couple of people said, yeah, baptize them. I'm like, I can't baptize them. <laughs> and then I just sensed, why not from the Lord? Like, why not? Why can't I? So I said, well, okay, let's go baptize these girls. So we're walking along now. We're leaving the main beach. We're headed over to this little rocky area known as Pirate's Cove that sort of overlooks the water, sort of a natural amphitheater. I have like 30 people behind me. I'm walking along, and I'm thinking to myself, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> this isn't what I do. And so I get down to the beach, and I take these girls down, and I take them to the water, and I'd ne never actually watched the technique of baptism. In other words, <laughs> I never watched to see, do you hold their nose? Do you hold them down for like longer than 10 minutes? I don't know. So I did my best. I sort of fumbled through the little baptisms and the girls are rejoicing. And I said, oh, Lord, thank you. I'm so glad that I responded to the leading of the Spirit. Isn't it great to serve God? God was just getting started. <laughs> you know, sometimes the Lord leads us just a little bit at a time. And he'll say, okay, I'm going to take you this far. Okay, now, now if you pass that test, I have another one. And if you do this, I have another one. And if we don't pass our first test, it doesn't go any further. So there I was. I was done baptizing the girls. I looked up on the rocks, and a few people had gathered and were watching us. And I looked at them and thought, well, look at that. A few people have gathered. Okay, I'm leaving now. <laughs> and the Lord spoke to my heart as clear as day and said, preach the gospel. Now, this is the thing I feared because I, I had this fear I might be called to preach. And, and I, I, I don't know what to say. But all of a sudden, this calm came over me, and I, I just started speaking. And next thing I knew, I was saying, and if you would like to accept Jesus Christ, come down here right now. And it's almost like I was standing next to myself saying, what are you doing? You are not Billy Graham. Stop it now before you get yourself in trouble. I kept going. I didn't listen to that other Greg. And some people came down and prayed with them to accept Christ and baptize them. But I didn't have a ministry open up for me. I went literally back to the drawing board after that, back to my design. And it wasn't until some years later. But as we started this church, uh, it was really a Bible study for young people. I, I, you know, that's all it was. I was a kid. Kids were coming. Uh, we were talking when we were getting started. Well, who's going to do our children's ministry? Well, there was only one person there with kids because we were all so young. I said, well, you do the children's ministry because it's your kids, <laughs> you know? What do I know about that? So, you know, as it began to grow and more kids were coming, and a few older folks, like in their early 30s, um, <laughs> people started calling me Pastor Greg. I said, well, I, I'm not Pastor Greg. I, I'm just Greg. I'm just doing the Bible study. I, in fact, at that time, I felt called to be an evangelist, not a pastor at all. I was 
well beyond just wanting to do design, which I did on the side, but I, I didn't feel called to be a pastor, but it kept growing and growing, and I realized in time I was called indeed to be a pastor of a church. So I just sort of settled into that, and I began to study, and for me, it's been a lot of on-the-job training. You know, I started learning. Sometimes I was working things out and preaching them that night. I don't recommend this, <laughs> but it's what I was doing. Uh, things I knew were true, but I hadn't really thought them through, so I was studying them and absorbing them and learning them and preaching them that very evening. It's been an exciting adventure, and then one day you wake up and 40 years have passed. And you think, wow. You know, but one of the things that I did when I was a kid was I, I always hung around older people. You know, I wasn't interested in being cool, because I was cool. You know, just, <laughs> already was. No, I am cool. Okay. At least I thought I was. Maybe that's one of the signs you're not cool when you think you're cool, right? I don't know. But maybe it's, never mind. Okay, so, but I, I hung around everyone I could that had been at this for a while. I spent time with Pastor Chuck Smith. I spent time with others that worked on the staff there. As the years went by, I got to know other great men of God like Alan Redpath, a preacher from England, and then I got to develop a friendship with Billy Graham and spend time with him, and I've met many others. And I'm not saying this to impress you all while you've met some famous people. It's really about meeting men and women of God that have, are further down the road than me, and I wanted to absorb everything I could from them. I wanted to learn well, because you see, at this point in my life, now I think about finishing the race I've started. Ricky's talked about, uh, talked about passing the torch, you know, and Paul says these things pass on to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And I've seen a lot of great men and women of God mess it up in the last few laps. Yeah. Uh, we, the Bible's filled with stories of them that did well in the beginning and blew it in the end. Noah, Gideon, others, uh, King Saul, the list goes on. So we want to finish well. So let's come back to the Apostle Paul. And here's Paul preaching to the city of Athens. Now, at this time, Athens was the cultural and intellectual center of the world. Just months ago, we actually were in Athens, Greece, and I stood at the Areopagus there, that spot where Paul preached his very sermon. But Greece at the time uh, was influencing the world. The great philosophers like Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and many others came from Greece, of course, and established patterns of thought that are still, to this very day, uh, believed. And so this is a very influential place. And Paul did what any person does when they visit someplace the first time. He went sightseeing. You know, Paul was a tourist. He's just kind of cruising through Athens, checking it out. And one thing that Paul noticed was these people were really into the worship of gods. One commentator said there were up to 30,000 gods with a small g in Athens. Everywhere Paul walked, there was an altar erected to this god, to that god. There was the altar erected to Zeus, who was the god of all gods. And there was Athena, the goddess of heroic behavior, Epaphrodite, the goddess of of love and lust, Nike, the goddess of shoes, and the list goes on. <laughs> Actually, Nike was a Greek god, but goddess, I should say. But, uh, you know, he, he checked this all out, and he absorbed it. And this is what happens now, as we see him bringing the gospel. And it reminds me a little bit of the islands. You know, because this is a destination. How many of you were born in Maui? Raise your hand. That kind of makes my point. You all came here. And most people that are here came here from somewhere else. And you have all these cultures intermingled together. Uh, you have Japanese culture, Chinese culture, Filipino, Samoan, Portuguese. Then, of course, you have your Hawaiian local culture. And all of this it provides you with great opportunities, but a very unique place, uh, unlike any other place I've ever been. Yeah. And so you have a challenge before you, and in some ways it reminds me of Athens, with all their ideologies. So how do we reach a culture like Athens? How do we reach a culture like Los Angeles? How do we reach a culture like Lahaina, or Kahului, or Waikiki, or wherever? Well, we reach it the same way that Paul reached it, 
by taking first century principles and applying them in the 21st century. Okay, so let's read a few verses. Acts 17, verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply troubled by all the idols he saw everywhere in the city. He went to the synagogue to debate with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, and he spoke daily in the temple square, or the public square, to all who happened to be there. And he had a debate with certain of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. If you have a pen, you might just circle the word Epicurean and Stoic. We're going to come back to who those guys were. Uh, and when he told them about Jesus and the resurrection, they said, this babbler has picked up some strange ideas. Others said, he's pushing some foreign religion. Then they took him to the council of philosophers. Come and tell us about this new religion, they said. Uh, you're saying some startling things and we want to know what it's all about. It should be explained that all the Athenians, as well as the foreigners in Athens, seem to spend all of their time discussing the latest ideas. So Paul, verse 22, standing before the council, addressed them as follows. Men of Athens, I notice you are very religious. For as I was walking around, I saw your many altars, and one of them had this inscription on it, to an unknown God. You've been worshiping him without knowing who he is. And now I wish to tell you about him. Now I mentioned that these groups, the, the, the um, Epicureans and Stoics, were interesting. So let's think about them for a moment. These were the two dominant schools of thought in Athens at the time. First there were the Epicureans. They developed their views from their founder, Epicurus. The Epicureans believed that the world came about by chance a random concourse of atoms. There was no afterlife. There was no future judgment. According to their founder, Epicurus, quote, the chief goal of life was to attain the maximum amount of pleasure and the minimum amount of pain, end quote. Uh, their basic belief was this life is all there is. You only go around once. If it feels good, do it. If it doesn't feel good, don't do it. Avoid what hurts or causes pain, <laughs> I guess you could say they were the party animals of the first century. You know, we all know people like this, right? They just live for pleasure. They live to get stoned. They live to get drunk. They live to go to the next party. They live for the moment. That's what their whole life is about. That was the Epicurean. They were effectively hedonists. Then we have the Stoics, who were a bit different. They were found, founded by a philosopher named Zeno. And in contrast to the Epicureans, the Stoics were more disciplined, shunning the pursuit of pleasure. Stoic philosophy, uh, philosophy taught self-mastery, and in some ways, uh, there are some similarities between the Stoic worldview and the Buddhist worldview, uh, which you would be familiar with in the islands, with so many coming from a Buddhist background. Uh, they believed that the chief goal in life was to reach a place of indifference to pleasure or pain. In other words, you can't control what happens to you. A life is filled with good and bad, according to Zeno, their founder. So just try to grin and bear it. They believed that God was in everything and everyone. God was in people. God was in trees and plants and animals and mountains and fields. Uh, one of the philosophers of this group was known as the Eggman. And he said, I am a, he is you are me and we are we and we are all together. That was actually John Lennon, but still, <laughs> it's similar. So that probably sounds pretty familiar to some of you. I would say sort of New Age mysticism uh, would be connected to this particular philosophy, and as I said, Buddhism in certain ways. Uh, but here we are in America now, and we look at all the idols that people bow before. In many ways, we're like the Athens of old, and, and the rule of the day is moral relativism which is believed by 67% of Americans. Wow. It's ironic that more than half Americans say they're Christian and, and more than half will say they believe the Bible is the word of God, yet somewhere above 60% will say they believe in moral relativism. Wow. And moral relativism is basically the idea that there is no such thing as absolute truth. You can't say something is right. Now maybe it's right for you, but it's not necessarily right for someone else. And if you dare to break ranks with the people that march lockstep with this philosophy, you are labeled as puritanical, bigoted, narrow-minded, etc. I have found the most intolerant people are the ones who talk the most about tolerance. 
People like to say Christians are intolerant. Now, maybe some are, but frankly, it seems to me that most Christians are extremely tolerant. Uh, we want people to believe in Jesus Christ. So we try to persuade them. But we don't kill them. We don't behead them. Uh, and we don't hate them because they don't hold our beliefs. In fact, we will love them and try to love them in the kingdom through our example after we have shared our message. But I find the people that talk the most about tolerance are very intolerant because it angers them when you actually hold a view that's different than theirs. And they, and they even want to silence us from expressing our views. Okay, so with this backdrop in mind, let's identify some principles uh, from this text about communicating with our generation. Number one, if you're taking notes, you might want to write this down. Effective communication must begin with a burden. Again, effective communication must begin with a burden. Look at verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed, underline those two words, to see the city was full of idols. Another translation would say his soul was exasperated or he was irritated. Even another translation says he was hot and mad. Do you know there is a place for anger? Righteous anger. And Paul was angry about the fact that these people believed in everything and anything but the true and living God. So he was burdened and he wanted to do something. Now here's the thing. If we don't have a burden, we're not going to do anything. And so we have to care about lost people. And here's my question to you. Do you care about people that don't know the Lord? Now, most of us will not say we do. So let me ask another question. When's the last time you personally shared the gospel? Now, those of us who are called to preach, you know, will often wrap a message up with a gospel presentation. But when's the last time you engaged a stranger somewhere and began to talk to them about Jesus? You might be surprised to know that it's far easier for me to preach behind a pulpit than it is for me to engage someone I've never met and start sharing my faith with them. That's why everywhere I go, I have a pulpit and wheels that they take with me. <laughs> Carry it in the back of a truck. I go to the market pushing a pulpit, get the bread, the milk, push the pulpit a little further. And someone says, what's that? Oh my, it's a pulpit. Let me talk. No, I don't do that. But, but you know, it's it's that friction, that difficulty as you begin to engage a person. But I think a lot of times, for those that are called to lead, and this is a word to you who are preachers, uh, do we really care about lost people? Do we really want to reach them? It starts with us. Spurgeon, the great British preacher, said this, and I quote, the Holy Spirit will move them, speaking of the non-believer, by first moving you. If you can rest without their being saved, they will rest too. But if you are filled with an agony for them, if you cannot bear that they should be lost, you will soon find they are uneasy too. I hope you will get into such a state that you will dream about your child or your hearer perishing for lack of Christ and start up at once and begin to cry, Oh God, give me converts or I will die. Then Spurgeon concludes, You will have converts. Wow. Listen, yeah. our churches need to grow because non-believers are coming in and finding Christ. Not just transfer growth, where someone leaves one church and comes to another. And if the church does not evangelize, the church will fossilize. Yeah, yeah. And the problem with a lot of churches today is they're living in a time war. Memo, the 60s are over. <laughs> As are the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And everything leading up. We need to be living in this present world. Well, this is the way we've always done it. So, you know, a lot of times in our ministry, I'll look at something we've been doing. It might be a retreat that we do. It might be the structure of a service. It might be the style of our worship band. It might be something else. And I'll just ask myself the question, is it still working? And a lot of times I just blow stuff up. You know, because I think, I don't blow stuff. Now, understand what I'm saying. First of all, I don't mean literally, okay? <laughs> but number two, uh, I don't mean that I, I'm getting away from the essentials. Uh, which is the exposition of the Word of God and, and so forth. No, but what I say is technique and style. Sometimes we are inflexible where we ought to be flexible. And we're flexible where we ought to be inflexible. Now, where should we be inflexible? With the core essentials. Always the Word of God is going to be taught. 
Always the gospel is going to be preached. Always we're going to have time for prayer and worship and the exaltation of God. The church exists for three purposes. The exaltation of God, the edification of the saints, and the evangelization of the world. Those are the core beliefs. We're here to exalt God, build up one another, and evangelize the world. So we never want to get that out of play. Another way to remember it is upward, inward, outward. Okay? Now, those are the essentials. I won't negotiate. But the non-essentials are musical style, graphic style, structural style. And we will get rigid on stuff. Well, this is the way we've always done it. And so, this is now. That was then. Which brings me to point number two. We need to be culturally relevant. Paul quotes a secular philosopher to build a bridge with his audience. Verse 28. He says, as your own philosophers have said, in him we live and move and exist. And one of your poets said, we are his offspring. (laughs) There are people today that have what is called a discernment ministry, which just basically means they like to nitpick. (laughs) They probably all live in their mother's basement. (laughs) And if you quote anybody they don't agree with, then they will take that quote and say that person quoted this person, and this person quoted another person, and that's new age, or that's this, or that's that. Yeah, right. Here's the point. Paul quoted a non-believing Greek philosopher who said one thing right to build a bridge to his audience because the goal is to build a bridge, not to burn one. And a lot of times we are arguing over minutia and missing the point. Paul built a bridge to his audience. He was culturally relevant. He wanted them to know he lived in the same world that they live in. A lot of times we we speak a cryptic language no one understands but us. You know, we share the gospel with someone and say, I don't know why people never respond when I share the gospel. Well, what do you say to them? Well, I say, hey, you uncircumcised Philistine, come here. (laughs) That's how you start? Yes, usually. (laughs) Sometimes I start with, did you know you're going to hell? And then I'll say things like, let me ask you a question. Are are you washed in the blood? Are you sanctified? Uh, Are you part of the body of Christ? Have you been redeemed? Well, you know, they don't know what you're talking about. Now, I'm not suggesting we not use biblical terminology. But I do believe we should not assume that our listeners understand what we're saying. We live in a time where people are biblically illiterate. uh, Even more so than when I started preaching. Uh, I did, read of a poll that was done recently and, and more Americans could name the names of the four Beatles than any of the Ten Commandments. Isn't that interesting? Do you know the Ten Commandments? No, but John, Paul, George, Ringo, I know that. <laughs> Brilliant. Another survey was done and many of the respondents thought that Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. <laughs> I'm not making that up. It's serious. And then Jay Leno did one of these things he calls jaywalking where he asked people, hey, um, who was swallowed by a whale? Most people said Pinocchio. And (laughs) so that's the age we're talking to. Don't assume your listener has any literacy biblically and don't accept or don't believe that they understand what you're talking about. Break down your terminology. Speak in a language they understand. Having said that, there is a trend in the church today, perhaps to try to be so cool that we're compromising our message. We are trading reverence for relevance. I want to be relevant, but I want to be reverent. Because the Bible says when I get into the pulpit as a preacher, I am there to declare the oracles of God. And you know, sometimes a lot of preachers today are are trying to say, look, I'm one of you. I have the same struggles you have and uh, I've even heard of preachers, you know, cussing in the pulpit. They think that's cool. That's not cool. I'm there to declare the oracles of God. I'm there to teach the word of God. And I, and I think there needs to be a respect there when we get up here and represent the Lord. So yes, we want to be relevant, but we don't want to sacrifice reverence. Paul said, I become all things to all men. Uh, He says, when I'm with the Jews, I become like a Jew. And when I'm with the Gentiles, I become like the Gentiles, yet not without law to God. So Paul's saying, yeah, I'll hang out with, and when we say Gentiles, let's just think of non-believer. That would be a better way to translate it for our day to day. When I'm around a non-believer, I'll try to relate to them. I'll speak their language, 
but I'll, I'll keep certain parameters in place, certain lines I'm not going to cross. Otherwise, in my attempt to reach them, I've sacrificed my integrity. A great writer, Graham Scroggie, said of compromise, quote, it prompts us to be silent when we ought to speak for fear of offending. It prompts us to praise when it's not deserved to keep people our friends. It prompts us to tolerate sin and not to speak out because to do so might give us enemies, end quote. Number three, Paul's message arrested the interest of his listeners. Verse 22, standing before them, I perceive that you are very religious. That was called diplomacy. He could have just as easily said, you guys are a bunch of pagans and you worship false gods. Would that have been true? Yeah. Well, absolutely. But that's not what he said. Hey, you know, I see you guys are really religious. Today we might say, you're spiritual people. You know, when I meet somebody who says, I'm into spirituality, instead of blowing them out of the water, well, what do you mean by spirituality? Now I'd say, well, really, that's great. I'm glad you're into spirituality. I'm into spiritual things too. Let's talk about that. And I'll try to take whatever they say and use it as a bridge to come right back to them. You know, if someone says, well, how, do you, how can you believe that a God of love would send someone to hell? Well, so you're saying you believe in a hell then, right? Well, I don't say that. Well, you said hell. You just, you're, you know, so you recognize there is a hell. So really, wouldn't you agree that there is a place for hell for certain wicked people that have done horrible things, say like a Hitler? Well, yeah, I guess I could say that there should be a hell for people like, okay, now let, you know, so you just take what they've said. Instead of cutting off communication and critiquing what they just said, try to communicate with them. That's what Paul was doing. He's showing us how to do it. Jesus was the master, yeah. master communicator. And look at him with the woman at the well. Here's this woman who's been married and divorced five times and is living with the guy. So Jesus is hanging up by the well when she comes to draw water at 12 noon. Why 12 noon? Because no one was at the well at 12 noon because it was hot. And she was a social outcast. And Jesus was waiting for her. So she's getting ready to draw water. He says, hey, did you give me a drink of water? She says, why would you a Jew ask for a drink of water? I'm a Samaritan. Don't you know that Jews have no dealings with Samaritans? Hey, if you knew who it was who was talking to you, you would ask him, and he would give you living water. Now he's engaging her. Well, what do you mean living water? And, you know, and, and on they go, and you know the rest of the conversation. But he draws her out. He speaks to her, and he speaks of the well as a metaphor of life. And if you drink of this water, you'll thirst again. But if you drink of the water I give, you'll never thirst again. That's the idea. Build a bridge to the person you're speaking to arouse the interest of the person you are speaking to but here's a really important point now paul preached to the people he preached men of athens see this is the thing we should never lose sight of the main way that god reaches lost people is through the preaching of the gospel christian media drama skits music all have their place but the primary way, primary way that God reaches lost people is through the gospel preached. Now that doesn't mean yelled. It can be shared conversationally. You can preach the gospel conversationally. You can preach the gospel on the street corner. But the idea is that it's through the verbal communication of the word of God. And this is one thing that the church was never stray from. We're called to preach the word. That's what we're here for. You know, Paul said to Timothy, preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Why? Because the time will come, Paul says, when people will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, or a better translation is, an itch for novelty. Mm. That's where we're at in the church yeah. today in many ways. Oh, people yeah. want to hear the latest thing, the new thing. Yeah. What's the new revelation from the Lord? Newsflash. We don't need a new revelation from the Lord. We have all that we need to know about God right here in this book. And listen to this. If it's new, it isn't true. <laughs> and if it's true, it isn't new. So some so-called preacher, man of God, whatever he thinks he is, tells you he has this new revelation from God. Wait a second, is it found in Scripture? And that's why we're to preach the Word and teach the Word and equip people for the work of ministry. That's what Paul did. He preached you men of Athens. Next point, his preaching was biblical. After he makes a cultural connection, he comes over to them with the word of God. Now, when it comes to speaking 
There's a place for illustrations. There's a place for humor. There's a place for other things. But ultimately, the power is in the Word of God. You see, Greg's Word will return void. But God's Word never will. Uh, God tells us in Scripture, Isaiah 55, that my word shall not return void. It shall prosper in the place where I send it. So I guess when we go into the pulpit, if we're a preacher, or if we go in a Sunday school room before a group of kids, or if we even go to a single person, do we have confidence in the Bible? Because my job is not to make the Bible relevant. I believe the Bible is relevant. There's a big difference. Well, I have to make the Bible interesting. The Bible's really boring, but I'll make it good. Wrong. <laughs> no, the Bible is God's Word. It's breathed by God. My job is to let the lion out of the cage. Hopefully not get in the way of it and let God speak through me as I open the Word to people. 2 Timothy 3.15 says, all Scripture is inspired by God. It's profitable to teach, profitable to teach us what is true, make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It's God's way to straighten us out, to do what is right, to prepare us in every way. So we give God God's word. Next, Paul preached the whole gospel. He used a word that you rarely hear in preaching today in evangelism today. In Acts 17, 30, he says, Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands people everywhere to repent because he's appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the men whom he has ordained. We're sometimes afraid to say this to people. We're afraid that if I tell them there's a future judgment, I might offend them. Listen to this. If you don't tell them, you'll offend God. So who do you want to offend? I need to say it lovingly. Don't say it with a smile on your face. You're going to burn! <laughs> The great evangelist D.L. Moody said you should never preach on hell without a tear in your eye. So when we talk about this horrific place, I want to do everything to warn a person to stay away from it. But I think a lot of people think there are Christians today because they just prayed a little prayer, but they never repented of their sin. Paul said to these people on Mars Hill, look, you guys have been ignorant up to this point. You haven't really known what's been going on. But I'm telling you now, now you're responsible. So check this out. God's called everyone everywhere here to repent. He laid it on the line. The message that we need to bring to lost people is the message of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. You know, Billy Graham was uh, getting ready to preach years ago. His longtime friend, T.W. Wilson was with him, and uh, Billy said, I don't know what to preach on tonight. And T.W. said, Billy, you only have one message. Preach that. <laughs> and you know, really, an evangelist only has one message. Now, when I get up and speak in these crusades or things like that, I mean, I'll have different texts and different illustrations and so forth, but I really have one message. And my one message is Christ crucified. Listen to this. Sometimes in our attempt to cross over, we don't bring the cross over. And if we don't bring the cross over, again, we've missed the point. Years ago, I was over at Billy Graham's house having lunch. And I was still in awe of him. I don't think I ever got over that, even when I'm around him today. He's just Billy Graham, you know. He's in a wheelchair today. He, he's lost a lot of his hearing. His eyesight isn't what it once was. But when he comes into a room, he's still Billy Graham. And because he's God's man, and God's put his hand on Billy in a singular way. But this was a number of years ago, and Ruth, his wife, who's in heaven now, was still alive. And Kathy, my wife, was with me, and she's here. I should have introduced her a long time ago. My wife, Kathy, is here, sitting right over there. Stand up, Kathy. And my son, Jonathan, is here at the back here, wearing a Hurley shirt right there, the big red circle. So I should have introduced uh, you to them or them to you a few moments ago. But anyway, so Kathy and I were there in Billy's house. I was, also Franklin, their son, was there. And they had one of those lazy Susans, you know, those things you twirl around. And Ruth had made us a great meal. And, and I, I was thinking, what can I ask Billy? I want to ask him something. And, and at one point, Billy looks at me and says, would you like a Coke? And it's just, even the way Billy said Coke was just like authoritative. Would you like a Coke? Yeah. Yes. I don't even really like Coke, but just the way you said it. 
Boo. And um, finally, I thought of a question to ask him. And I said, Billy, if a younger Billy knew what an older Billy knows today, what would you tell yourself to preach on more? And he, without missing a beat, looked at me and said, who let you in my house? <laughs> and he picked me up and threw me out and slammed the door. And it was one of the most humiliating moments of my life. Anyway, back to the text. <laughs> no, that didn't happen. But it should have. No, Billy looked at me and said, I would preach more on the cross and the blood of Christ because that's where the power is. Amen. And that young preacher at the time took note of that. Preach more on the cross and the blood. Yeah. So if you're standing in a group uh, in front of a lot of people or a few people or one person and you're telling them about Jesus, just remember this. The most powerful thing you're going to say to them is the story of the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. Tell them that story. Use your story, your testimony. It's good. But don't let your story take the place of his story. Because your story is just a bridge to the greatest story ever told, the story of Christ. So, one last point. We must leave the results in the hands of God. Look at verse 32. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, well, we'll hear you again in this matter. Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed. Among them was the Onesias, the Areopagite. Now this is interesting. This is the apostle Paul. Yet he didn't always have a revival breakout when he preached. This was a low response, we might say. Not many. But you know what? Conversion is in the hands of God. I've never converted anybody. And if I have, they're one pathetic convert. Jesus said, no man comes unless a father draws him. So conversion is the work of the Spirit. I never try to pressure people into believing. I don't want to trick them in. I don't want to manipulate them in because I feel if they could be manipulated in, they could be manipulated out. I just believe my job is to present the truth and pray and leave the results in the hands of God. That's our job too. So those are a few thoughts about reaching our culture today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you've called us to yourself. And we thank you that you've given us the message. And you've given us the power to declare the message because you've said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Then you said, all power is given unto me. Therefore, go do this. So your power is there for us to fulfill this command. Help us to go into all of our world and preach the gospel. To go into our sphere of influence. We commit ourselves to you. We commit every church that is represented in this room to you. Lord, thank you for them all. Because really, when it's all said and done, we're one church. We have many locations. But we're one church. We're the church. Called out by God from this culture, from this world, to serve you, to worship you, to honor you. Bless every pastor. Bless every associate pastor, every worship leader, every Sunday school teacher, every usher, every person who labors uh, faithfully for you. You've told us in Scripture to not be worrying well-doing, for in due season we will reap if we don't faint or give up. So help us never to grow tired of your work. Sometimes we're tired in it. And we need a break, but help us to never be tired of it. And to remember what a privilege it is to be called to serve you. So we commit ourselves to you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All righty then. God bless you guys.